Medieval musicology has a fundamental problem, and that is there are too many chants. We've established this, I think, this morning. Too many traditions, too many notational systems, not enough manuscripts fully and expertly analyzed, mostly too many chants. The vastness of the repertoire and the limitation of even the most impressive scholarship it has been a constant theme in all of the literature that you read when you start into this field. Um, in terms of paleographic studies and uh, uh, specific analytical questions, there's always that line at the end, more research needed. When we teach medieval musicology, we train students to expect certain content in liturgical books and identify chants, as we were talking about, all these sort of um, read me files, basically, uh, for the various things we do. And then when the student finds that expected content, they see it, they identify it, they make lists and inventories, they edit and carefully curate them. Our databases grow over time, and we're making, therefore, impressive inroads into what used to be known as unknown areas, and more and more books are being discovered and analyzed, and, and chants and repertories, as we've heard, and more, and, and, but then what do we do? Efforts to conserve and preserve this repertoire have, I, I, that create this kind of fundamentally important baseline, and I'm not going to try, I'm not trying to undermine any of that, of course. Um, what I want to do now is look beyond uh, what I'm gonna call the hunter-gatherer approach, um, where scholars sort of devote themselves to finding new chants and they bring them back and other scholars with particular interests kind of go and they work with these chants and then, and then the scholars go out and find more hunter-gatherer, bring them back um, and, and we've got that sort of modus operandi happening. Um, that works really well in small-scale studies and also of, of, of particular genres, that sort of thing. Um, as musicologists, of course, our, our job is to situate these pieces of chant as music in relevant and interesting contexts, both within their original culture and then in ours as well, so the current perspectives on this. And we focus on their composition and their meanings and all of that sort of thing. Um, do we do this contextualization enough in chant studies? broadly. That's kind of my question. I think we do try. We look at late compositional style, big air quotes. I've got like a page long of footnotes at the bottom of this for that. Um, <laughs> we use exegetical or even political lenses, more footnotes. Um, we understand the connection between sermons and chants, sacred texts and chants. We compare contrafacta, that's what Jennifer was just doing. Um, we identify common cadential formulas that show up all the time. We even look for word painting in the, in the corpus that we have. But these studies are necessarily restricted by the number of chants it is possible for a human being to encounter or grasp through what is largely a kind of a purely academic encounter. I know of very few scholars, I do know a couple, who regularly sing or even hear these melodies. The rest of us just sort of understand them as, as patterns, as musical gestures, um, a way of setting sacred texts and prayers to music, and that music is something that is really something lost to us in our minds. Now, instead of being slightly embarrassed about that state of affairs, I suppose we, I propose we actually take a look at it. To use the analogy when we're, I, I, I sort of made up an analogy in the middle of the night when I was trying to write this. Um, when we're confronted with, with this vast sea of thousands and thousands of chants, we can either de decide to be expert fishermen you see, my analogy grows. So either we're on the boat and we're fishing for particular kinds of chants, or we get off our boat and into a helicopter. What about readings of ocean temperatures and depths and aquatic populations across vast areas and migrations and dangers? In other words, get a bigger picture. Of course, neither approach is better, and each approach benefits the other. But investigations into this bigger picture can be a kind of a risky departure from the time-honored hunter-gatherer thing I was just talking about. 
We can make mistakes in how we compare or categorize data. There's a lot of methodological uh, bugaboos that need to be worked out. And, if, and, and, and at first, the benefit to the experts in particular fields of, 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 of sort of smaller genre-based research, sometimes that big picture, the benefits are harder to see. But, I was reading last night, our friend David Huron, who does a lot of work on this and corpus studies and stuff at OSU, um, he, in his final page of an article called The Age of Big Music Data, he says this, ultimately, disciplines are defined not by their methods, but by the questions they ask. And the development of new methods, however, can often make it easier to pursue certain questions. Conscientious scholars focus on the questions and then acquire whatever tools best allow them to address these questions. Never before have researchers had access to such powerful tools for posing and addressing music-related questions, both the trivial and the consequential. As in, this has a relationship, this does actually correspond to both types of, of research. Um, it's just figuring out what the appropriate questions are and then not missing something in your, in your approach. Until recently, Almost all of my research had been contextualized by these projects that find, identify, catalog, chant. I sort of cut my teeth on working for the Cantus database even as an undergrad and then through graduate stuff. Um, but the problem of scale really began to concern me when I was working with Andrew Hughes in his last years. Here was a man who had literally spent his entire working life, and his entire life was his working life, as a hunter-gatherer, a formidably effective one, with an, with an appetite for the newest technologies available and an incessant need to cover more ground. Three days before he died, he was interested in doing a particular new thing that hadn't been done. We were talking about it. He knew and knew a lot about exactly what there was still to do in this sort of hunter-gatherer regard, and how many chants were being conducted on, or so how many chant studies were being basically conducted on too little evidence. And he basically just decided to devote his life into getting more evidence. Once or twice a year, he would write his own articles based on something that he discovered in his massive collections, but the majority was simply handed over to the scholarly community in the form of books and computer disks and databases. And the late medieval liturgical offices, I've already seen it once in the footnotes um, there, is a kind of a quintessential example of that, where he just sort of said, here, here's 6,000 chants, do with them what you will. Um, but there were many other volleys like that, most of which our community is still hesitant to use. Why? Perhaps our community has a lot of fishermen and fewer oceanographers. There's Hughes looking at something in the LMLO. <laughs> now, as medievalists know, the interdisciplinary playground is where all the fun is. Because traditional musicology has had some um, specialized preliminary requirements, let's say, uh, such as the ability to read and analyze music in various notation forms, and a, familiar, a familiarity with certain sets of canonic works and, and liturgical layouts, it's been a little slow to adopt this interdisciplinary outlook, um, but that's rapidly changing. And in medieval musicology's case, given the problem of repertoire size that I outlined earlier, I think one of the most enticing fields with which to partner is big data. When you start looking at chant melodies as data, you run into a PR problem right away. Talking about chants in this way gives the impression of a kind of a dismissiveness, as though you've chosen to trade the melodies themselves for some larger remote observation concerning the whole repertoire. It also smacks of a kind of a dehumanization uh, that we see in our world of you know, cell phone data tracking and targeted advertisement on Facebook. Do we really want to do that to medieval prayer? Of course not. 
But in the absence of an opportunity to have those monastic bells ring in our ears every day, or the psalmic patterns of recitation and cadence permeate our musical world and our understandings, an approach that deals with all melodies equally is a useful thing. So take, for example, these 6,000 chant melodies in the LMLO, the late medieval liturgical offices by Andrew Hughes. So here we have a string of data. We can look at them like this, or we can look at them like this. Well, that's a close-up. There's some MEI based off of the TEI stuff uh, from earlier. TEI, MEI is based on TEI, uh, where you essentially describe what you're seeing in graphic terms, and then you throw it into Verovio, which is an engraver, uh, online engraver, and you can get um, the melodic, uh, or at least, you know, dots on a staff, uh, equivalent of the melodies that were numerically encoded in the LMLO. So what can we do with that? Well, we can sing them, we can publish editions of medieval saints' offices, we can study their poetry, we can study their layout in terms of modal order or even text settings, we can, but if we treat them as a string of data and look outside of musicology to see what other disciplines do with their strings of data, maybe we're going to come up with different ways of looking. Um, here I have a note that I didn't actually talk about uh, corpus studies in linguistics, which I'm thinking about more and more, and I think that it actually has a lot to do with what we need to do with chant, because linguistics is talking about a single oral phenomenon. They, they, they're not talking about the written word, right? They're talking about the way uh, you would hear a sentence, and that has a lot to do with chant in terms of its singularity. There's nothing um, uh, harmonic going on. There's not counterpoint. Um, and it also has sort of beginning, middle, end. It has cadential structures, all of those sorts of things. Um, so corpus analysis studies in linguistics is another place to sort of turn. Where I'm gonna go, though, um, is engram analysis, which is not quite the same thing as corpus stuff, but it's similar. Um, so here I've got embedded, hopefully that works. Oh, cannot open, fun, okay, don't worry about it. We don't need that. Um, it was just gonna be a big string of numbers. Um, what you can do is you can run uh, computational vectors across lots of melodically encoded uh, or numerically encoded mel melodies in order to get a kind of a reading of distance between one melody and another. And you put that distance into math terms and that gives you uh, a way of plotting visually how similar one melody is to another. And you can do this with two data strings, but you can do it also, you can kind of introduce slippage in here. So this is where you get computational biology techniques in terms of when they match genes, they will allow certain amounts of, um, of, of, of distance before they say this is different from this, or this is a variant of this. Um, so those sorts of, mathematical calculations are, are done in other fields, we can do them here too. Um, so playing with melodies as data has revealed that many chants of all genres share melodic material across plagal and authentic modal divides. Uh, we've found 21 identifiable melodic passages in chants uh, whose modes are not connected by a common final. So very rarely do people do that. They go, okay, let's look at mode five and mode eight, let's go. Um, but you can, you can see that when you're looking at the bigger picture. Um, so this, the, the title of this paper, it refers to Douglas Adams' electric monk, um, teaching the electric monk to chant. Uh, and that electric monk is a, is a character in one of his sci-fi books, funny sci-fi books, that has been developed by humans in order to outsource their belief systems. So the monk will believe everything for them while they go about their life. And of course, I don't wanna outsource the singing or the understanding of medieval chant to a robot. However, what we can do now using the melodic data and, uh, and also then using AI in this, form, it's a um, recurrent neural network, is we can use a robot to 
compose chant, basically. So when you get strings of various distances, and you can see, most people have kind of seen stuff like this before, um, you can plot their distances and you can see visually melodic families in various modes, but you can also do this not looking at specific modes. You can just um, uh, mess with the parameters a little bit. Uh, and then you can start seeing uh, fragments and gestures and things that unite particular melodies and, and differentiate them from others. Differentia. Um, basically, we're trying to teach my electric monk to sing. Um, <laughs> now, I am not an AI specialist, but here's how neural networks have been explained to me. They're basically massive statistical probability model machines, and they learn by analyzing the data which they've been given to predict what the most likely next step will be at any given point on the data string. So starting at the beginning of the chant, therefore, the first note will likely be one of a few options depending on the mode of the chant and then whatever note is picked will then determine what the probabilities are for the next note in that mode and on and on it goes. Um, but it's learning from the data set you give it so the bigger the data set the better it's going to be at this. This has an aspect of Chomsky's generative grammar in it um, and it also has an aspect of what we've been doing for a long time whenever we look at formulas and, and, and formulaic chants because there's a kind of a predictive element that comes up. If you start this way, you're going to cadence in this way. If you go to this pitch, you're going to come back down to this other pitch uh, or likely will, right? So you can kind of pr propose models about how these things are thought about. Um, the neural network can't make aesthetic decisions, and it also can't compose melodies that reflect the semantics of the text. And I think this is very important, because I'm about to show you some stuff that, like, I call it bot chant, because it's not chant, it's like what the neural network composed when we said go after having fed it hundreds of chants. Um, but it can formulate with a pretty amazing accuracy the progression of pitches that we recognize as a viable chant melody. And so questions about whether or not there are things like word painting and how much semantics are involved in the construction of a melody really come to the fore when you start sort of trying to, trying to figure out what it is that they're, they're seeing. So um, let's do it first with the LMLO. I'm giving you a real chant there. This is what Hughes transcribed. Uh, by the way, this is using the MEI and Verovio um, thing, which has only been possible since like last summer, um, because before you had to read it in its numeric uh, in, in coding. And then uh, Ichiro Fujinaga and a guy named Yao Long uh, in McGill decided to have pity on me and write a little script that turned the numeric encoding into MEI. And from there, you can just throw it into Verovio or whatever you want. Um, so there it is, we can all sing. Um, but I, what I want, I'm, I'm just gonna look at mode eight for time reasons. Um, and, and you'll see that if you, if you know anything about kind of late medieval chant composition, you'll see that this is a good example of this. The ambitus is pretty wide, you've got zigzag patterns, you've got um, jazz at the end there, uh, which is, you know, very, uh, like, like the discipline of late medieval um, responsory compositions. And then we can look at an antiphon if we want um, and kind of compare. So it's a little bit more restricted in its vertical ambitus but, and a little bit more syllabic, but again, we're kind of hitting the same um, prioritized pitches in mode eight. Um, now that we have seen some things that actually exist, let's look at my bot chant. So that's what, the, that's what the computer spits out when it's told to compose in mode eight. Uh, that's two examples. I can give you the list. I've got like 50 pages of this. Um, and I've, I've shown you those two because I think that they, um, I've got this separate page here where I try to tell you what I think is going on. Right, so we can look at this for, from various ways. Um, the first thing we can do is look at what the neural network thinks is typical in terms of interval and range. So in ascending 
gestures. You're almost always stepwise. Sometimes you're in thirds. If fourths, if a leap of a fourth happens, it is always to the reciting tone in all of these bot chant things that I've got. Descending, it's mostly stepwise, infrequently by a third, and if the leap, uh, the leap of the fourth does not happen unless it's between the two kind of polarities of mode eight, which is C and G. Um, and oddly, even though you will see, can I go back up? Yeah. So in almost every single instance of mode eight LMLO chant, you get a low D at some point. There is absolutely no D in anything that my bot chat has spit out, and it's spit out, damn, I think we stopped it at 50 um, of these things. Um, and that, I think, is because when you run the numbers and look at the probability, D is always accessed by F in mode 8. So you go down to F, and then you drop to the, to the, to the D. But statistically, 90% of the time, 90? 90. 90. 90% of the time, if you hit an F, it's because it's a lower neighbor to G and you're going back up. So never will the, will the RNN decide that it wants to do a D. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not like a possibility in the real world, obviously. But like to identify where these sort of errors or, or, or kind of miscues are is an important step, obviously, when you're looking at that. Contour. So what does the bot think about contour? How is it learning about it? Well. The rises happen more quickly than the falls. That is also something that you get in, in late medieval chant. Um, the longest string of notes generated before sounding the final again, as in, if you're on G, how far can you go into the stratosphere before you have to end up back on G again? This is coming from the world of formulas and things. Um, the longest time the bot ever goes is 14, which is longer than anything in the LMLO does, but the average is something like seven or eight. And that is very commensurate with what we see in LMLO. So they've got phrase length, basically, uh, just from looking at what's there. Again, text is not involved. That is, I got an article to write. Anyway, um, so, and then finals other than G. So in my bot chat, about 15% of the time, you get an A as a final. And about another 15% of the time, you get a G, uh, an F as a final. But if you look at where they're coming, they're coming in the same places as where in the LMLO, you can take what is a kind of a typical formula and just add a neighbor tone on it to elide a kind of a credential figure into the next bit of the chant. And that's exactly what's going on with the bot. So you'll see like the next thing that it does is, is embedded in that thing. So we've, we've looked at elision therefore as well, just by giving it a bunch of samples, seeing what it does. Um, and the final thing I've got here is kind of the grammar of mode eight. And by this, I'm gonna show you, these are the short. So, so, so we didn't, we kind of stipulated how long they had to be, but this is, a, this is a version of the short stuff that the bot will give us. Um, so we stopped it, we said, we said no fewer than five. I think we said no fewer than five, yeah. Um, no, I got a four up there, whatever. Um, but these, some of them are actually like legit differentia. Um, some of them look almost like it. Some of them look like intonation formulas, um, but almost all of them are kind of gestural in a way that incorporates something about the identity of a semitone versus a whole tone in modes. Um, now this is just mode eight, right? So we've done this for mode one, two, five, seven, and eight. Um, haven't run the other modes yet, but we will, it's okay. Um, but looking at what is there, um, I'm starting to develop a kind of a thesis about like musical gravity in modes and, and, that, there's, and that there's a kind of a pull between D and, or a, a G and an F, a C, excuse me, G and C, right? Because like final and recit tone, obviously. But then if you look at what happens around it, um, so I was gonna kind of, gonna point at, I can do it there, I can do it here. So this guy. All you need are those three pitches to identify mode eight, or at least what mode eight sounds like most of the time. Because you go, nee, dee, 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 right? And, and so that's all you need to kind of like say, mode eight, guys, like that. that. And, and if you start thinking about those as kind of conceptual units, not like note, 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 um, but identities, um, maybe you're further along in terms of how the, how the medieval composition process worked. 
Um, then, just for fun, because I was kind of out of my depth in late medieval stuff, because I'm really an early medievalist, <laughs> um, I decided to run it on what I pulled off the Cantus database in terms of the Volpiano transcriptions. I just went like, here, here's a bunch of Volpiano transcriptions purely from the wild, and I threw it into the RNN, and this is the kind of stuff it gave back to me. Um, some of it is crazy, obviously. Uh, it, it kind of like, I mean, starting on a B flat, right? That third one, this one here. Um, but do you notice how the first one kind of looks like a big long antiphon with a differentia at the end? And how that one sort of looks like a responsory? The, the middle one there, where um, it kind of divides it here, and you end on a G, and then up here you end on that C, that C, which would be a typical response reverse relationship, where it like leads back into the repetenda in the in the response tree. Um, so you're kind of getting formal stuff spit out as well. So thinking about melodies and their relationship to form and how they're crafted onto a kind of a formal infrastructure uh, is another place to go with this stuff. Um, this is really raw, like literally I did this a week ago. Um, so, and, and also we just threw all the modes in together. So we didn't separate it out by mode because I just wanted to see what would happen. Uh, so that's what happened. Uh, basically we're, we're doing a lot of mode one, <laughs> I feel like. Uh, that, that's what they've done. Anyway, I will now conclude by going back on book. Hang on. Um, so apart from being a great party trick, this bot chant stuff, uh, the question becomes how can this help chant scholarship? Well, it can reveal tendencies we've probably missed in our assumptions about what is obvious and what isn't. It analyzes more chants more accurately and quicker than we can ever do in our lifetimes. And it provides a kind of objectivity to compare our findings on a smaller scale to a kind of a larger corpus. It gives context to projects with particular regional or temporal focuses. So let's say I'm really interested in late medieval chant from France or whatever. Then we can kind of start talking about that in, in, a, in, a, in a more defined way. Um, basically what I'm trying to say is it is the forest for our trees. It's the oceanography for the fishermen. Knowing Andrew Hughes, whose mug that is, um, this kind of research was the, was the stuff that he really dreamt of contributing to. Uh, I imagine him there in the 1970s or 80s in yet another monastic library in Spain or Italy or Switzerland. He rented a camper van and took his whole family in the summers, that's what he did. Copying out those melodies onto those cue cards one by one. To him this was not stamp collecting. This was musical archaeology the first step to a kind of a process of recreating an entire musical world that is now mostly lost to us, but nevertheless of fundamental musical importance. And if we share that vision, then we should use every tool available, including even the electric monk.